So good day to everyone and thank you very much for joining. My name is George Fenton. I'm the chairman of uh, the Humanitarian Logistics Association. And as part of our 2020 knowledge sharing series, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar on reducing the carbon intensity of humanitarian logistics, uh, which has been organized by, um, with my colleague, Professor Alan McKinnon of the Kuna Logistics University and flexport.org. This is a follow on to our webinar that we did last year on this key topic, as we want to highlight the importance of leadership and collaboration to tackle climate change. In March this year, I think, uh, Sophie Punte, uh, the, who is the executive director of the Smart Freight Center, posted a blog entitled Supply Chains in the Time of Corona. She said that during crisis, industry leaders must show that their organization has a plan to deal with supply chain vulnerability. Your supply chain is part of a wider system, but of course you can't control it. And in adverse uh, conditions, uh, there is a massive knock-on effect to the rest of the system. So there's an importance to be better prepared. And there's a need to think about supply chains with three interlinked objectives, those being resilience, visibility, and sustainability. Of course, the good news is that companies and organizations can now piggyback on rapid developments in the area of IT, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And I'm happy to say Flexport is a digital freight forwarder uh, that uses cloud-based software and data analytics to give customers full visibility and control of their supply chains. So our guest speaker today, Kathleen, will share more information about that. So meanwhile, the, the UN sort of has put the issue of climate change, it seems, on the back burner due to the pandemic. But of course, it would be a mistake to drop that altogether. Uh, and so choosing carbon reduction as a key indicator of supply chain re resilience and efficiency will help to prepare for a future where carbon is money. Carbon pricing schemes already cover about 20% of global CO2 and are likely to expand. And Alan, I think we'll be touching on that later. Uh, with better knowledge of your logistics footprint, you can report to stakeholders and use the results for better decision-making and action to reduce emissions. The HLA recognized that the emergency preparedness and response depends upon effective logistics management and as a membership organization, we act as a knowledge sharing and advocacy platform to support humanitarian logistics professionals, organizations, communities, and individuals who respond to crisis. The current pandemic is a stark reminder that we must be better prepared to respond to large scale disasters around the world, but to do so as efficiently and as sustainably as possible. So through this webinar, we'll discuss the opportunity for humanitarians and businesses to adopt a new approach to talking about climate change. So I am recording the webinar now, and uh, then we will be able to share that through our social media channels. Um, I'm going to hand over to Alan McKinnon, who's um, been researching and teaching logistics for over 40 years and uh, has published extensively on decarbonization. And um, so I look forward to your presentation, Alan. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, George, for that uh, introduction. Um, and uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening uh, to everyone online, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's a pleasure uh, being invited to do this. Um, maybe I should say a few words about my university before I move on. Um, it's a university specializing in logistics. It's uh, located in Hamburg in, in Germany. Um, it's celebrating its 10th anniversary uh, this year. And um, sustainability and humanitarian logistics are actually uh, some of our uh, core competences uh, within the, the university. Um, I always like to begin presentations on decarbonization with a few words about the climate science, uh, simply to remind everybody as to why it is we're doing this. Uh, because you know, over the past couple of years, in a sense, we've, the vocabulary has changed. We've moved from talking about climate change to talking about a climate emergency. And it's not difficult to see why. 
uh, there is a huge amount of claim of scientific evidence now um, confirming that we have an enormous challenge in dealing with climate change. Um, many of the trends are summarized on that slide uh, in terms of sea level rise and increase in carbon dioxide concentrations and so forth. Uh, for me, one of the most worrying journal papers I've read on this subject uh, so far was published in Nature in November last year. I don't think it got the press coverage it deserved. Um, when it talked about how close we are coming to climatic and, and geophysical um, tipping points, you know, and, and the worry is if we cross those tipping points, there'll be no easy way back. Um, and this is the main reason probably, um, you know, why we're trying to reduce our carbon emissions um, to set limits uh, on the uh, future temperature increase globally um, to minimize the risk of us uh, crossing these tipping points. Just to put that into perspective, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in a report in 2018 um, worked out that for us to stay within the one and a half degree temperature increase, that's between 1850 and 2100, um, to have a th two thirds chance of staying within that figure, um, we have a remaining carbon budget of about 420 gigatons, a billion tons of, of CO2. Um, and to put that into perspective, we're currently emitting about 42 gigatons. So there's some simple arithmetic to be done there to suggest that um, in, in 10 years time, if we continue to emit CO2 at the current rate, we will have exhausted that carbon budget, uh, in which case we will then overshoot the 1.5 uh, degree figure. We're currently on a trajectory which would do that. Nevertheless, many governments around the world have recognized the problem. Um, last count, I think 22 countries in the world committed themselves to being net zero greenhouse gas emissions by, uh, by 2050. Um, and that covers about 10% uh, currently of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, in his introduction, George mentioned COVID um, because uh, COVID has clearly had the effect of uh, reducing the level of emissions. Um, it was estimated that at the time of main period of lockdown um, in April and May this year, that uh, the reduction in economic and social activity worldwide uh, reduced uh, CO2 emissions by about 17%. Um, but it was worth noting that even at that point, uh, that did not put us on a, a downward trajectory, which was steep enough for us to stay within our 1.5 degree target by 2030. So if nothing else, COVID has shown us just how dramatically we're going to have to reduce our emissions if we're going to stay within these climate targets. And uh, this graph, I think, also illustrates this. So the red line shows our current trajectory. The, um, the, the middle line there shows the, what happens if all the countries in the world uh, meet their COP21, their Paris pledges. Um, but neither of those things take us close to getting on the right pathway to and get the increase in average global temperature down to one and a half degrees or, or to two degrees. So we have a huge challenge facing us. And of course, we're already suffering the consequences of this. Um, and, uh, you know, if one looks at the geographical distribution of weather related, uh, climate related uh, extreme events, many of them are concentrated in the tropics in less developed countries where humanitarian logistics operations tend to be concentrated. And you know, there's a lot of evidence to show how the frequency of these extreme weather events is gradually increasing and that is projected to continue. So you know, regrettably, you know, I think we're going to be seeing a steep rise in the future level of humanitarian logistics activity worldwide. Um, now, if, if the humanitarian logistics sector aims to be zero carbon at some stage in the future, or at least to achieve large reductions in total emissions, then that will mean that the carbon intensity of humanitarian logistics activity will have to drop uh, very steeply to compensate for that. And that really is the focus of this uh, presentation. Um, I also posed the question, you know, what are the prospects of this sector achieving a net zero target by 2050? Uh, the target which is now being adopted by many governments and which many businesses are now committing to, you know, is that relevant to the humanitarian this gets us into the area of what I call the ethics of climate change. Um, because at the heart of all of this, it seems to me, there's a fundamental climate injustice in that the countries which are contributing least to climate change are the ones which are going to suffer the most. 
And it raises the question, you know, what benchmarks should we do to measure, uh, which benchmarks should we apply to, to measure the carbon intensity of humanitarian logistics activities worldwide? You know, sh should we compare the carbon intensity of humanitarian logistics against that of the business world? Or should we relate it to the, um, the, the businesses operating in those countries where humanitarian activity is focused? Or should we take account of the average annual CO2 emissions of the people that are served by humanitarian logistics? Well, that's an interesting one, because uh, if you express this on a per capita level, there is an enormous range in annual per capita emissions of CO2 worldwide. This is an interesting diagram, comes from the International Energy Agency. Um, and the countries where humanitarian activities are concentrated are on the left side of that diagram. You know, where the average citizen in those countries have vanishing, has a vanishingly small um, carbon intensity. Um, and therefore, um, it seems to me that, you know, even if humanitarian logistics had to have a high carbon footprint to maintain life and, and welfare within these countries, it seems to me that is perfectly acceptable. Moving on to logistics. Um, what's logistics contribution to climate change worldwide? Um, somewhere between 10 and 11% of global CO2 emissions come from logistical activities, most of that from free transport, about 8%, warehousing terminals, somewhere between 1% and 2%. Um, if, if we include the administrative and IT aspects of logistics, as we should, it would be a bit more than that, but to my knowledge, nobody has yet quantified that. There is wide recognition now that logistics is going to be one of the hardest sectors to decarbonize for two reasons mainly. One is because of its very heavy dependence on fossil fuel, but also because of its very high forecast growth rate. Um, it would be nice to know what the current carbon footprint is of humanitarian logistics worldwide. Um, I have never come across that figure. I suspect it's not as yet been calculated. When I work with organizations uh, to help them develop a, a decarbonization strategy for their logistics, I apply what I call my 10C approach. It's um, 10 stages um, with English words beginning with the letter C. And so I've really built this presentation around this framework. So the first is, is corporate or organizational motivation, um, because there has to be an internal commitment to do this. It is hard to decarbonize logistics. And if there isn't sufficient enthusiasm to do it, it ain't going to work. Um, but if one thinks of the humanitarian sector, I mean, to some extent, it's under external pressure also to decarbonize. Um, it was interesting to see the responses there to the, uh, the little survey that was, that was done, um, because in asking what are the main drivers, um, the, the number one driver was leadership uh, within the organization. Um, which I think is the case in, in, in much of the commercial world um, as well. But I think one has to recognize that increasingly um, the humanitarian organizations um, are going to be put under what I call environmental pressure from the donors, from organizations like the UN, and, and also the host governments and where they operate. And I think when we're on, on this topic still, it's worth drawing a distinction between different levels of logistical decision making. This is a framework that I developed about in the mid-90s, a long time ago, um, where I classified logistics decisions into four categories. At the top end, you've got the strategic decisions. As I say, they're relating to the numbers, locations, capacities of the factories and the warehouses and the shops, things like the infrastructure of logistics. Next level down are the commercial decisions relating to the trading links with upstream suppliers, downstream customers, and subcontractors. Level below that um, relates mainly to the scheduling of these activities. It's the operational level um, relating to the um, nature of production operations and distribution. And then at the bottom level are what I call the functional decisions. The decisions made day to day by transport and logistics managers, because within the framework established by the higher three levels of decision making, um, these managers still have some discretion as to how well they load the vehicles and where they route them and so forth. And in a sense, environmental engagement is required at each of those four levels because those decisions interact. And unfortunately, you know, the work I've done over the years with a whole range of organizations leads me to feel that a lot of the green measures that are being implemented tend to be applied at the lowest level in that hierarchy. 
But at the same time, many companies are making higher level strategic and commercial decisions which are offsetting or negating the effects of those lower level decisions. And, and I think this is something we have to bear in mind when we're looking at how we decarbonize humanitarian logistics. Another point I'll make here is that there's been a proliferation in recent years in the number of what we might call green freight uh, organizations worldwide. Um, which are all promoting and supporting the decarbonisation of freight and logistics activities. Um, in his introduction, um, George mentioned a blog by Sophie Punta, who was the founder and, and is currently the executive director of the Smart Freight Centre. In fact, they compiled this diagram, um, but they've also been very active uh, in, in this area. But so for, for organisations, um, embarking on decarbonisation for the first time, that there's a lot of external support that can be received uh, from these organisations. My second C is calculate emissions. Now, Kathleen is going to say more about that later, so I'll, I'll, I'll limit my uh, comments on this. Um, there are a number of decisions that have to be made when an organisation tries to carbon footprint its logistics operations for the first time. The first thing is, is where you draw the boundary around the calculation. And there are four dimensions to that. Um, in an organizational sense, you have to decide if you're going to measure your scope one, two, or three emissions. Scope one is the direct emissions that you're responsible for. Scope two relates to electricity. And scope three is the emissions from organizations that are working on your behalf, either because you've outsourced your logistics or maybe you've sourced materials. Um, so in the early stages, many companies just confine their analysis to the scope one and two emissions. But it's best practice if you can also include your scope three emissions. There's a geographical dimension to this, obviously. There's a functional dimension. You know, what activities do we consider to belong to the definition of logistics? Obviously, it's going to be transport, it's going to be warehousing, inventory management. But to what extent do you include IT or packaging or recycling? Um, I think the best advice here is to keep it as inclusive as possible. And then there's a hierarchical dimension to this as well. I mean, to what extent should we be able to disaggregate our carbon emissions, taking it down from an organizational level, down to the business unit, the facility, maybe even right down to the products and to do a life cycle analysis of the emissions of the products. Um, the other issue that companies encounter when they start doing this for the first time is in trying to choose the right methodology, the right reporting standards. Now, until recently, that was difficult because there was a, a, a huge choice. There were many organizations uh, offering uh, approaches and, and methodologies, and we have needed harmonization of this. And, and um, the Global Logistics Emissions Council that was set up in 2014, um, set up by the Smart Bait Center, has done a great job, really, in bringing organizations together to try to achieve convergence in the way that we measure uh, freight and logistics emissions um, and to develop reporting standards. Um, and the other thing that's happened in the meantime, of course, is that logistics service providers have been building up their capability to measure carbon emissions. Now, uh, you know, a large proportion of humanitarian logistics is outsourced to these organizations. And so indirectly, the humanitarian sector benefited from that. Things into my, my third C, which is committing to targets, because once you know where your emissions are coming from and how big your carbon footprint is, the next thing is to put in place some targets for reducing them. Now, one of the critical issues here is, I mean, how do you define those targets? Uh, in the business world, most of those targets are currently defined in terms of carbon intensity, emissions relative to some level of activity. But government targets are defined in absolute terms. The planet works on absolutes. The planet has no concept of what carbon intensity is. Um, and therefore, we increasingly have to move to setting absolute climate or carbon reduction targets. Now, to help with that, there's another major global initiative uh, called um, Science-Based Targeting. Uh, we set up some years ago uh, to advise all sorts of organizations on how they should be setting realistic targets in line with the climate science. Um, I think currently there are about um, 970 organizations have signed up uh, for this. Um, last time I checked, I didn't see any humanitarian logistics organizations uh, in there. It's mainly businesses, um, but uh, that's certainly worth uh, investigating. But raises the question of what would be a realistic target um, for the humanitarian logistics sector. Uh, I mentioned earlier, and indeed uh, George in his introduction used the word piggybacking, um, 
because many of the big logistics providers have now set quite ambitious targets for decarbonizing their operations. And obviously the humanitarian organizations that use their services, you know, again, benefit from that. So the DHL, I think was the first uh, big logistics provider to commit to being net zero carbon by 2050. Um, and then Kuhn and Nagel about a year ago, uh, again, um, the world's largest freight forwarding company, I mean, made the point that they wanted to be carbon uh, neutral for their scope one and two emissions by the end of this year. Um, the other thing one has to do is looking beyond these organizations at um, industry-wide uh, ambitions. Um, so the ICEO, which is the UN body responsible for aviation, um, again has set what it calls aspirational goals for decarbonizing aviation. Uh, they want the growth of both passenger and freight uh, movement by air to be carbon neutral beyond 2020. Uh, they also are committing to a 2% per annum increase in fuel efficiency uh, as well. And on the shipping side, the International Maritime Organization, they, 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 I would argue, come up with more ambitious targets. They want to see a 50% reduction in shipping emissions between 2008 and 2050. Um, and, and they ultimately want to phase out emissions from shipping um, as early as they can uh, in this, uh, this century. Um, but these are longer term targets. What can organizations do in the meantime? Well, I mean, the data we have available suggests that the current carbon intensity of air and shipping uh, companies varies a lot. Uh, there's a significant amount of work being done in benchmarking their carbon intensity. So my university in Hamburg has been the academic partner of the Clean Cargo Working Group now for several years, the Clean Cargo Working Group which represents about 80% of container shipping worldwide, um, benchmarks container shipping lines by trade lane, um, and that information is made available to shippers. So that if shippers wish to take account of carbon intensity when selecting carriers, they can now do that on the basis of that data. Another thing then is, is to look at the way in which organizations procure uh, freight and logistics services in the hope that they will do that in a way that is environmentally friendly. And I'd like to plug another thing by the Smart Freight Centre, it was a, a report they published uh, last year, um, setting out a good practice in the procurement of uh, logistic services in a way that helps to reduce carbon emissions. Um, moving on to my fourth C, which is considering possible options. Because once you've set your targets, you know, what um, measures are you going to put in place to, to achieve them? Um, when I first got involved in this uh, about 20 years ago, I remember running a brainstorming session with academics and, and logistics directors um, trying to decide what one could do to decarbonize logistics. And in an afternoon, we came up with 87 different things that one could do, um, but um, which is great news because there's no silver bullet here. It's the whole spectrum of things that we have to apply really to, to decarbonize. The, the measures really fall into five general categories. One of the things that we can do to reduce the amount of freight movement. Second thing is to shift as much freight as possible onto lower carbon transport modes. The third is to optimize the um, utilization of the vehicles. The fourth is to improve the energy efficiency of the freight movement. And then the fifth is to reduce the carbon content of the energy we use in the freight and logistics sector. Now I'll come back later on and I'll talk about these uh, five things in more detail. My, my fifth C is collaborate with others because there's a general recognition now that to achieve the really deep decarbonization of freight transport that will be required to meet our climate targets, there will have to be much greater sharing of logistics assets. That, that companies doing this on their own will not be enough. Now, in the case of the humanitarian sector, I'm well aware of the cluster, cluster framework and the world um, food program has had for many years had responsibility for the logistics cluster um, to coordinate logistical activities across the humanitarian sector. And it seems to me that really um, provides a very a, a great framework really for coordinating uh, decarbonization initiatives in the sector uh, as well. Just to give an example of the carbon benefits you can get from logistical collaboration, um, th there are some case studies which are now quite widely reported. This is one involving Nestle and PepsiCo in the Benelux countries, um, where initially they delivered their products uh, separately. Um, they then had a logistics provider called Steph um, to group their, their consignments. 
Um, and then the third stage was when the companies actually engaged in what we called collaborative synchronization, where they adjusted their schedules in a way that tried to maximize utilization of the vehicles. And in the table on the bottom right hand corner, uh, you can see the uh, net effect of that on carbon emissions, you know, CO2 emitted per tonne of product delivered, um, how you could um, you know, re reduce that carbon intensity by over 50% um, by um, engaging in this process called uh, collaborative synchronization. Now that, that's a commercial world example, but you know, I'm, I'm sure that um, many similar carbon benefits could be enjoyed by humanitarian organizations. The next stage of my um, framework is cost evaluation, uh, because obviously any organization is gonna want to decarbonize in the most cost effective way which gets us into what I call the economics of logistics decarbonization, which is a rather complex subject, but I'll try and keep it simple. Um, again, a good news story. I mean, it seems that um, there's a very close correlation between cutting CO2 emissions and reducing cost, um, because a lot of this is energy related. You know, it's by reducing energy consumption, you save money and you cut emissions. Um, and in the case of the humanitarian sector, this would mean the donors would get better value for money, in a sense, if, if this translated uh, into financial benefits as well as uh, um, carbon benefits. Um, there's wide use these days of um, a method of cost analysis called MAC, Marginal Abatement Cost Analysis, um, where you try to estimate the potential CO2 savings you get from different initiatives, and also you look at the, the cost impact of that. Um, so in this diagram, um, each of those columns represents a, a decarbonization initiative. Um, the width of the column is an indication of the amount of greenhouse gas that you would save. Um, and then the height of the column or the depth of the column is a measure of the, the financial impact. So where the measure falls below the x-axis, um, you're enjoying a cost advantage as, as well as a carbon saving. Where the, where the column is above the line, then you have to trade off uh, cost against carbon. Uh, and, and there's actually a positive cost. Now, the good news is that there is a lot of low hanging fruit. Those organizations that have done this analysis find that a lot of those columns actually fall below the line. Um, you know, where there is a, a financial saving, often a fairly rapid payback, uh, and those uh, activities then would be, would be self-financing. The sad news is, however, that um, harvesting all of that low-hanging fruit isn't going to allow us to achieve our climate change targets. This is a diagram um, which was originally developed by Laurie Tavassi, a professor in the Netherlands, um, and he looks at three phases in the development of uh, decarbonisation. Um, we're currently in, in the, the low-hanging fruit phase, right, when we're sliding down that curve, um, uh, finding in relatively inexpensive ways of decarbonizing, but that isn't going to be enough. We, if we have to get to that red dot, we have to move into a second phase uh, where the costs start to rebound, uh, the carbon mitigation costs rise, and then we may have to ultimately get to what he, he calls a, 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 an austerity phase um, when there will be very high mitigation costs. Now, in the commercial world, that may mean that profits will be sacrificed, the rates of return on investment will be reduced. Um, in, in the humanitarian world, well, let's hope that there's no compromising with the um, quality of service provided with the welfare and, and, and life-saving um, activities that humanitarian logistics organizations are, are involved in. But um, raise me to another point about the monetization. Again, this is a topic that uh, George mentioned in his introduction. It seems to me that once we put a monetary value on CO2 emissions, that will be a game changer. Uh, it will then feature in companies' balance sheets, and uh, this will give them an added incentive to um, reduce their emissions. Now, the World Bank actually compiled a dashboard of carbon pricing initiatives around the world. Um, and currently, if, if one looks at those schemes in place and currently being planned, uh, if they were implemented, that would cover a, just under a quarter of um, greenhouse gas emissions currently worldwide. So there is a big move now to putting a monetary value on carbon. And I simply ask the question, what would be the Im implication of uh, emissions trading and carbon taxation on humanitarian logistics operations? I don't know if that's currently being investigated. Moving on to my next C, which is choosing appropriate actions, because once you've evaluated the carbon benefits you get and also the, the cost impacts, you then 
going to decide what to do. And, and the message here is there's no one size fits all in, in putting together a package of initiatives and developing a decarbonisation strategy that has to be tailored really to the nature of the operation, the location, the nature of the state market and, and so forth. Um, the other thing which you might want to consider at that stage is whether you want to carbon offset, because it may be that within the budget you've set for this, you feel you're not going to be able to meet your carbon reduction targets by implementing initiatives directly yourself. Um, it may be that managerially it's just not possible to achieve those targets with internal action, in which case you may have to pay someone else to cut emissions on your behalf, which is what carbon offsetting actually is. Now, I know um, Kathleen is going to be addressing the subject shortly. Um, all, all I will say is, you know, sh should we regard carbon offsetting longer term as an acceptable route to carbon neutrality? Um, in the case of the humanitarian sector, I mean, would this represent a legitimate use of donors' funds? And my constant worry about this is that carbon offsetting can be a distraction from companies you know, making a genuine effort to cut their emissions. Um, so after carbon offsetting, you know, you've got the plan in place, you then implement it, you cut your emissions um, and you learn from that experience. And in the light of that, you might want to calibrate your strategy because you put in place various feedback loops. Uh, it may be in the light of this, you discover your targets were just too ambitious or maybe not ambitious enough. Um, you may want to recalibrate them. You may want to change the range of options that you've applied. You may have to um, modify your, your cost evaluation. But you, you've, we've set in motion a learning process. And a lot of companies are at an early stage in that process currently. Um, but through time, knowledge will, will build up. Um, what I'd like to do now in my remaining time is to focus on the decarbonisation options. Remember the five options that I, I mentioned earlier. The first I said was to reduce the amount of freight movement. Now, in a sense, there are two ways in which you can do that. One is just reduce the material intensity of the products. In other words, reduce the amount of stuff that you, you have to move by reducing waste, by light weighting, downsizing, right sizing the products, increasing their durability, um, increase recycling. Uh, I know there's been uh, work done recently on, on how one can improve what we call reverse logistics within the humanitarian organisations. We could also deploy 3D printing. I mean, there was a journal paper published just a few years ago by a colleague of mine, Peter Tatham, uh, and his colleagues, um, and, which was very positive, suggesting there's, there's a, um, uh, significant applications available of 3D printing in, in humanitarian uh, logistics. Um, but it, it's the environmental implications of this which interests me. Um, two years ago, I, I put my neck out and, and I, I suggested that um, 3D printing might be a decarbonizing silver bullet, um, that its impact on the supply chain may be one of decarbonization. Uh, the publisher of the paper was a bit naughty because in my original manuscript was a question mark. He removed that, so it made it appear that I was asserting this, but no, I'm merely speculating. The other thing you can do to reduce the amount of freight movement is to reconfigure your supply chain, you know, to source more materials locally, which is already happening, I think, in this sector, with the switch away from in-kind donations towards cash payments, where the money can be spent locally. Um, flows could be more efficiently routed, we could decentralize some of our inventory, we can restructure distribution networks, as indeed the world Food program has done um, in a state in India uh, where they uh, reconfigured their distribution network and, and in the process that reduced the distance that materials had to move from the warehouse to the delivery point by about a fifth, um, which then would translate it into a significant carbon reduction. But I mean, we get back to the basics of logistics management here, which I always say involves optimizing trade offs between transport, warehousing, and, and inventory. Now, to date, those analyses are couched almost entirely in economic terms. But what we need to do increasingly is to factor CO2 emissions into those trade-off trade analyses. And another thing which I should just mention very briefly, because so far all my talk has been about transport, um, the, the, the warehousing and materials handling, or as the Germans call it, intra-logistics aspects of uh, logistics. Um, people are very optimistic about decarbonizing warehousing operations partly because they rely on grid electricity and, and most countries in the world are now driving down the carbon emissions per kilowatt hour. And some people are suggesting that by the 2030s, a lot of warehousing will be carbon neutral. Um, they could even go beyond that. Um, this is a, 
the warehouse in the Netherlands uh, opened last year and they claim this is the most environmentally friendly industrial building in the world. Um, it's covered in 13,000 solar panels, which doesn't just power the warehouse, but also 750 homes in the surrounding area, which makes it a carbon negative warehouse. Now, um, in much of the tropical world where humanitarian logistics activities are, are focused, um, th there's a lot of sunlight, you know, so there's a lot of potential there for using solar power, it seems to me, to, to decarbonize the logistics buildings. My second set of initiatives is, is moving to lower carbon transport modes. And th there's an obvious reason for this. I mean, the carbon intensity of transport modes varies enormously. If one uses the official UK data on this, it suggests that um, on average, long haul air freight is about 116 times more carbon intensive than the average consignment moved in a container ship. Um, and obviously the humanitarian logistics sector is very heavily dependent on air cargo movements for good reasons, because um, these are time sensitive emergency deliveries. Um, but, but not everything is uh, an immediate uh, emergency response. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of products moves in the humanitarian supply chains, um, which is less time sensitive. And, and there may be some potential there for switching to lower carbon uh, surface modes. Uh, I should also maybe mention drones because they're increasingly being deployed in humanitarian logistics. And any you know, of the batteries of the of the vehicles are recharged with low carbon electricity, then this is actually quite a, a low carbon means of, uh, of delivery. But if one looks worldwide at the use of modal shift to decarbonize, most of the discussion is about getting freight off the road network onto the rail network, particularly in, in, in the developed countries of, of Europe and North America. Um, but I see that maybe as being less of an issue here. Um, because um, you know, the, the, there's a lack of rail infrastructure in, in many of the less developed countries where humanitarian activities are, are, are focused, um, and also the quality of the rail services there are often quite poor. So, so the, the, the road rail modal shift, if it can be done, obviously it's desirable and should be encouraged, but, but it seems to me probably to be less of a concern. And, and again, I'm open to comments on that, that issue. Uh, but it makes, makes me wonder just how fully modal shift options are currently being explored within the humanitarian logistics sector. Just one other thing too on speed. I published a paper in 2016 asking to what extent the deceleration of freight transport might be a means of decarbonizing logistics. And my colleagues thought I'd gone mad. This was considered heresy at the time. Um, and it, it probably is not applicable in the humanitarian logistics sector. There was a MIT study on the carbon intensity of, of um, humanitarian logistics back in 2013. And they said it's unreasonable and impossible to cut transportation as speed within the supply chain is most vital to save lives. And I don't think anybody would dispute that. They also went on then to do some analysis where they looked at the, they did the life cycle analysis of uh, materials used in Haiti um, by the Red Cross. Um, and they made the distinction between pre-positioned stock, in this case it's uh, plastic sheeting, as opposed to emergency uh, shipments. And uh, you can see how in the emergency shipment, which was dominantly by air freight, uh, had a much higher carbon intensity. Um, and also if you look at the pie charts on the right hand side, you can see how the composition of the life cycle analysis vary enormously. So in the case of the pre-positioned stock, the transport related emissions were only 4% of the total, whereas it, when it was done on an emergency basis using air cargo, uh, the, it was over three quarters of the emissions came from, from transport. But when I advance my I, argument that we should think about deceleration, um, my, my point was that there are a lot of non-transport activities in the supply chain, internal to factories, warehouses, shops, and so forth, where you can accelerate those processes. There's a lot of slack time there to allow you then to reduce, or allow you then to, to lengthen the transit times. Um, and, and so even within the same fixed order lead time, you can cut emissions simply by reallocating time between different logistics functions. Okay, now I'm not sure to what extent that might be a benefit to the humanitarian logistics sector. My third set of initiatives is optimizing vehicle loading. Here we're obviously aiming to reduce empty running, improve the loading of vehicles, but also to avoid overloading. Um, as, as happens, I think, across much of the developing world, 
um, where the engine is laboring and uh, its fuel efficiency then reduces or and also where the surface of the road gets damaged uh, which then has an adverse effect on the fuel efficiency of, of all categories of traffic. Now I, I haven't not seen data on this but I mean to what extent are the vehicles used in humanitarian logistics underused? What is the potential for reducing empty running and raising load factors in this sector? Um, how you do it? Well obviously by consolidating loads within infrastructure on operational constraints, as I say here. Uh, this is where collaboration, it seems to me, um, can be very beneficial in, in sharing loads. Uh, another thing too is, is what we're beginning to see in, in many less developed countries is the development of online freight exchanges, providing uh, online load matching um, to make better use of vehicle capacity. This is a selection of uh, online freight exchanges currently active in, in India, uh, for example. And, and I think the humanitarian sector should tap into that if, if it doesn't already do so. This is a, maybe a depressing um, graph. It comes from the International Transport Forum. And what it is, it's their projection of the reduction in the carbon intensity of road freight operations between 2015 and 2050. And seeing how that compares around the world. And the metric here is tons of CO2 per vehicle kilometer. Um, and you see that the EU, where I'm currently located, um, is, is doing well and we're it's anticipated to see a, a huge reduction in the carbon intensity of road freight. But look at Africa at the other end, look at the Middle East. Um, these are the areas where the logistics cluster, for example, is very active in, in moving freight, surface freight. Um, so, so therefore, the humanitarian logistics sector moving freight by road in, in these parts of the world isn't going to enjoy that same reduction in carbon intensity that we're seeing in the EU or China or North America. Which leads me on to my fourth um, uh, set of measures, which is to do with the energy efficiency of freight transport. Now, of course, there are a huge range of constraints on the energy efficiency of road transport in less developed countries, food infrastructure, chronic traffic congestion, in, in the case of humanitarian activities, a lot, a lot of it isn't actually on paved roads, it's, it's going over rough terrain. Um, the, the, the truck fleets that are used are old and under-maintained, there's a lack of skills in how to drive the vehicles fuel efficiently. There are weak government regulations on things like overloading and vehicle maintenance and poor compliance. Um, the, the trucking companies in these countries, everywhere in the world, are, are under intense commercial pressures. I mean, for them, it's a case of trying to survive commercially. And, and so it's hardly surprising they don't pay enough attention to fuel and to CO2. And of course, it, again, in much of the developing world, there are diesel fuel subsidies made available, but which makes fuel cheaper and, and therefore reduces the incentive to improve energy efficiency. Um, however, um, what we are also seeing is the development of fuel economy standards for new trucks uh, began in Japan, it's now been adopted in, in other parts of the world, in North America and, and in Europe, um, which requires truck manufacturers to achieve certain levels of carbon efficiency to be allowed to put their trucks onto the road. Now, um, th these truck manufacturers, eventually their vehicles will be sell, sold into the developing world uh, but unfortunately, there'll be a time lag, you know, typically five to 10 year time lag. So these higher standards for fuel efficiency and energy and CO2 efficiency in trucks will eventually reach less developed countries. But unfortunately, it's going to take a significant time for that to happen. Other things can happen in the meantime. One of those cost effective ways in which you can cut carbon emissions from road freight transport is by training the drivers to drive more fuel efficiently and also to put in place telematic systems which monitor their driver behavior and then they can be given guidance on, on how they can improve their performance. And you know, a lot of research, mainly in, in the developed world, suggests you can get about a five to 10% fuel saving or CO2 saving from driver training and that could be supplemented by another five or 10% from telematic monitoring. Moving on hurriedly to my final um, set of initiatives, reducing the carbon content of the energy used in the freight transport sector. And I'm, I'm focusing here simply on, on road freight because of limited time, but um, obviously you know, we, we look at uh, how this is being applied in other sectors like shipping and, and aviation. Currently in the developed world, and particularly in Europe and in North America, there's a big debate over the most um, likely, most cost-effective, quickest way of shifting away from fossil fuel to another power source. So we've got competition between battery powered vehicles, 
hydrogen powered vehicles where the hydrogen goes through a fuel cell, um, biofuel, I think the biomethane, or even electrifying the highways with catenary systems so that the trucks can draw their low carbon electricity from, from overhead. And nobody's very sure currently as to which of these technologies is likely to dominate. Each of these uh, different uh, energy sources has a lobby campaigning on their behalf. So we're uncertain as to what the right decarbonisation pathway, I think, is going to be for, for road freight. But let, let's think of how this will impact on less developed countries and on humanitarian logistics. It seems to me there's going to be a long transition time changing the, the power source uh, in trucks in less developed countries. Uh, because if it's batteries, then you've got to put in place a, develop, a battery charging infrastructure. If it's gas, if it's hydrogen or biomethane, you've got to put in place a, a network for delivering that. If it's e-highways, you've got to put catenaries over your road infrastructure. You've got to get the cost of these new vehicles down to make them affordable to trucking companies in these parts of the world. You will have to have an import market created for these vehicles, but Electric vehicles on the whole will have a much longer lifespan than internal combustion engine vehicles, so it may be some time before these vehicles cascade down through that import market. We also have to see the decarbonisation of grid electricity in these parts of the world. And on the map on the right, you can see how currently the carbon intensity in grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour varies enormously around the world. Um, and the other thing is that you then have to have enough grid capacity to charge all of these vehicles. Um, which will be a real challenge, it seems to me, in, in many of the less developed countries in, in which humanitarian logistics activities. So I have to say I'm not too optimistic about this happening anytime soon. I think the decarbonisation effort should probably focus on the other things that I've mentioned. And then just finally, I, I have said very little about IT uh, in all of this. Um, th th there's a general acknowledgement that um, IT and digitalisation um, will promote the decarbonisation of freight transport through the things I'm mentioning there. I mean, online freight procurement, data pooling, Internet of Things, blockchain, inter intelligent vehicles, advances in vehicle routing and scheduling, no question. And, and, and uh, the, what I'm not sure is, is what the current rate of adoption is um, of these things by the humanitarian logistics sector, but it's to be encouraged, and I think they will have a big impact on its uh, carbon intensity. I'm sorry that's all been a bit rushed. I hope you found that of interest. Um, I've written a book on this subject that was published two years ago. Um, uh, it's uh, available in all good bookstores, as they say. Um, the other thing is that uh, within KLU, I compiled uh, a video course. Um, it comprises 68 um, two to three minute videos. The whole thing lasts about two hours and 40 minutes, um, where I discuss all of this in much more detail. Um, it's available to free of charge um, to members of the Humanitarian Logistics Association. Um, so those of you who are interested in the subject might want to take advantage of that. And um, at that point, I will stop and uh, take any points of clarification or, or questions. Thank you very much, Alan. And that was very interesting. I see that we have uh, one quick question from uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, I can allow you to talk. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. Hi, Hi. this is um, Rebecca Dart. I'm, I work for Oxfam Novib. Uh, it's a lot to take in and this has been a really good um, webinar so far. Um, for us, one of the things that we really struggle with is uh, the standards and the reporting method. Um, if we look at fleet, there's one standard for for freight, it's another, air travel, another, electricity. They're all different standards. And with air travel, um, many companies, uh, even global companies, use the UK standards, which actually don't work if you're based in the EU, mm. which Oxfam mm. Nova is. <laughs> and then, yes. of course, we've got uh, countries around the world where we're doing operations. So we need a standard that works everywhere and so I was wondering how close really are we you mentioned um, one of these standards mm -hmm. um, but having a, a, a one way of working how close are we to having that um, yeah we're not there yet um, but but I think we're making good progress um, I, I don't know if you've looked at the the GLEC reports because what GLEC decided to do was was not to try and reinvent the wheel but to, to, to take advantage of much of the work that had been done previously, right? So, so for each of the transport modes, um, they have come up with 
an, an approach to doing it. Um, what what they, they don't do as yet is actually define emission factors. Um, you mentioned the UK work on this. I mean, the DEFRA numbers, uh, which are updated every year, um, really ought not just really ought to be used only in the UK. But I, I've, I've seen organisations around the world deploying the, um, the, the the DEFRA numbers for emission factors. Um, so I, 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 my advice to you would be to to look at the work that the GLEC is doing. The GLEC is currently working closely with the International Standards Organisation um, (ISO) um, to align their approaches with ISO um, and they have now got a lot of traction from a lot of businesses and a lot of sectors so it seems to me that it would make sense for the humanitarian logistics sector to to work with that um, as, as well and, and many of the big logistics providers DB Schenker, DHL, Kunanagel and so forth are now using GLEC and, and so it seems to me that's the way to go. I may be biased here because um, KLU is one of the strategic partners of the Smart Freight Centre, right? So I maybe should have mentioned that. Uh, but but um, it, it seems to me to be the lead organisation pushing for this. So that would be my recommendation. Yes, you were right. I was talking about the, um, the emissions factors, especially because obviously DEFRA has one, one uh, figure and if you're reporting in the Netherlands you have to report against that at different standards and you have to change the factors. Yes, but, but there, in a sense those factors have to adjust to the country. Uh, you know, take, take rail freight for example. Um, the split between electrified haulage on the rail network and diesel haulage varies a lot from country to country. Um, and therefore you, you can't just use a standard real freight CO2 emissions per tonne kilometre figure for every country. So you, you really have to take account of those local circumstances. What concerns me is that the, the, the figures derived for one country then get applied in other countries and, and where that really isn't legitimate. Um, the other thing I will mention is, is eco transit, um, which uh, is a, an online tool that organisations can use um, to to carbon footprint uh, freight journeys. You can specify an origin and destination, you can see which transport mode it's going by, and it'll give you an estimate, I think, of the energy used, the, the CO2, and I think other externalities, I think maybe also SOX and NOx as well, possibly. So that, that's also quite a helpful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mike, uh, Rebecca, for the question. Um, we've got a few other questions coming in uh, on the Q&A, which I think we will respond to uh, after our next uh, presenter, um, and uh, in the interest of time, we need to switch on to uh, in my introduction to Kathleen Hegesy, who is from the um, flexport.org. And um, so Kathleen will talk, talk to us about uh, some of the, the challenges and opportunities that uh, Flexport has been able to, to generate as a as a logistics company. So over to you, uh, Kathleen. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today, and thank you, Alan, for the incredible overview and the approach that you're taking. Um, truly, the expert in the field. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll just quickly introduce Flexport and Flexport.org, and then spend the majority of the time discussing how you can take some tangible steps to start to think about this in your organization. Uh, but just to introduce, Flexport is the modern freight forwarder. Companies use Flexport not just to move freight, but to make better decisions about it. And this is all powered on one digital platform shown here with a combination of technology, infrastructure, and human expertise. On the next slide, we offer a full range of services uh, from air, ocean, trucking freight, uh, financing, insurance, and customs. But on the next slide, um, most importantly, what we wanna do is give every user visibility and control over your supply chains. So you're not just looking at um, what your logistics moves are, but really having a strategic approach to how you do that uh, with really predictable service. On the next slide, my team is flexport.org and we build on this technology. Our goal is to use logistics as a positive force for social environmental impact and to help companies and nonprofits and humanitarian aid organizations bring sustainability into the core of your supply chains. The next slide. Um, since 2016, we've worked with nonprofits and aid organizations to provide pro bono and discounted services. So we actually help move your logistics and freight operations for natural man-made crises and disasters, but also ongoing international development. 
We have a full team of 10 people dedicated to helping you achieve those goals. And we also have three engineers who only build tools and programs for Flexport.org. Um, so we're just really dedicated to using our technology for good and to help you achieve your goals. And on the next slide, Alan, I think, did a really great job of giving an overview of how extreme this crisis is. It's not just climate change, but a climate emergency, like he said. Um, but we really believe that as you're shipping aid, you're, of course, emitting greenhouse gases, which accelerate those cycles. So how can you do something about that and really start to make a change? On the next slide, uh, we of course know logistics has to be a part of this. Everyone on the line I think knows this, this is why you showed up today. Uh, but we wanna give an overview of the partnerships available and how we can help you do that. So on the next slide, um, at Flexport.org, we have a three-step process to help you implement change today. It's measurement, reduction, and offset. Um, and I will quickly go through just kind of how we approach this, but some takeaways that you can work on immediately and how we at Flexport.org can help you do this. Um, I saw, you know, in the poll question that budget and resources are often a big constraint to actually implementing this, which again is why we use our technology and our resources to help you do this, you can actually start to focus on, you know, the bigger meatier questions and we can help take away some of that low hanging fruit. So next, uh, step one is just measurement and understanding your baseline. Um, some key steps as you do this is determining your scope. So not just those scope one through three emissions, but also if you're doing this for the first time, maybe your time frame. Are you looking at 2019? Are you going to start with 2020? How are you actually starting to implement this? The biggest factor I often see is your available data. So what do you have on hand that you can pull from to calculate? Or are you working with providers to actually get that emissions data for you? Um, oftentimes, your measurement will only be as accurate as your available data. So it's just taking a step back and saying, what do we have? How can we work on this? And if you think you might be incomplete or if it seems like you're not quite there, maybe just set a buffer percentage. Maybe you're going to add 10% or 15% to what your emissions are to be safe and know that you're over-calculating rather than under-reporting. I often see that the first step of measurement can be a huge barrier. Um, Ultimately, measurement should help you understand what your baseline is and where you're able to tackle your next steps from. So while you should really want to be as accurate as possible, I think time and energy should be spent on that reduction part. So how can you make this as easy as possible to really work towards next steps? On the next slide, um, one of our key tenants at Flexport.org is making measurement free and accessible. We are also a huge believer in the Smart Freight Center's Global Logistics Emissions Council framework. Um, our calculator was just accredited by that framework. And we think it's really, really important that everyone tries to work towards that global methodology. Um, the handbook that Alan mentioned is extremely helpful. There are emissions factors towards the end, and it helps you understand you know, a true framework and guidance for how you can approach this. At Flexport, we calculate emissions based on your shipment journey. So if we're moving your shipment, it'll be every part that we're touching and picking up for you. Um, we show, you, show it to you on a shipment level and also aggregated as an example on the right-hand side where you can see your historical emissions by mode, by destination, by supplier, whatever is most important to you as a decision maker. No matter where you ship or who you ship with, uh, we can help any company do this for free, any organization. Um, so definitely reach out to me if you haven't started measuring yet. We have both um, a public calculator API, which you can integrate into your systems. Uh, we can also help analyze shipments if you have Excel or CSV reports. So we'll take that data, run it through our backend calculator, which is accredited by the GLEC framework and help you do that for free. Um, again, we open our technology up so that even if you don't ship with us, you can utilize it and help you get that baseline so that you can focus on the reduction efforts. Which brings us to the next slide in step number two, reduction. Um, I have an EDF source that's 47 times more emissions when you're moving air versus ocean. Alan has 116. Let's use 116, but also another importance of why a global methodology is important and why we need to all use the same factor. Um, if you click again, it might not show up, but there's an animation. There we go. Um, the different ways that you can start to think about this today, even if you have a more limited resource scope and budget, what can you immediately do? 
Um, there's course thinking about your modality. Um, can you do barge instead of trucking in the EU or you know domestic rail if it's an option? Um, but oftentimes it's going to be maximizing every container move that you're doing, not overloading, but can, if you're shipping ocean containers, is it fully maximized? Can you consolidate instead of shipping smaller 20 foot containers? Can you consolidate to 140 foot less often? Um, what are ways that you can strategically plan your supply chain now to do that? But most importantly, I think it's often working with your logistics providers. Um, a provider might default to prioritizing speed and cost, especially speed. Um, so if at the outset you're saying, I want to also consider carbon emissions when making decisions, or these are the KPIs I wanna see, this is the progress I wanna track and the reports I want available, Oftentimes you just have to have that conversation up front. If your provider doesn't know that that's a key priority for you, then it might not even come up in the conversation because there's so much that happens in these logistics conversations that it might not even come up. Um, so first and foremost, kind of raising your hand saying you want to do that. And there's other ways technology can come into play. Um, so for example, when we quote a shipment, um, we show the carbon emissions for different routes or different options. So if you see not only are you comparing maybe two different air transit times, if you can compare the carbon emissions ahead of time and know that you're going to work this into priorities of what you do, that can be a helpful step right away of something you can take every single time as an action, um, even if it's not um, part of a larger strategy. The last part here, um, I would say, is just regularly reviewing it. Oftentimes, I think organizations do maybe an annual reporting or quarterly reporting without really integrating it into every single day-to-day -day decision making. It should be something you review with leadership amongst your teams, internal planning, but also with your stakeholders. So it's not just kind of a one-time exercise, but something that's included in every conversation. You have your priorities and sustainability needs to be part of that if it's going to be part of ongoing change. A quick example of reduction on the next slide. Um, we worked with Clean Canteen, who's a B Corporation with a goal of reducing waste through re reusable water bottles. Um, just by switching to Flexport, we help logistics managers bring visibility and control with that technology. And they saved eight hours a week on average, but also saved CO2 emissions. So by using that reduction or that planning where you can actually plan for emissions and not just transit time and routing, they were able to save carbon emissions and better align with their mission. Now on the next slide, um, Reduction can only get you so far. Uh, right now, there aren't scalable options for emissions-free planes, trucks, ocean vessels. Um, there may be some promising options and we hope the technology is gonna continue to improve, but we believe in carbon offsets because it's a way for you to immediately take action for emissions without waiting for technology to catch up. Or if you don't have the budget and resources to do a comprehensive overall, overhaul of your supply chain, you can do this now. Um, it's very important that it's not a long-term goal in and of itself. Um, we often think of it as a band-aid of something that you need to do now while you can't avoid emitting emissions. Um, but there are very important tenants of carbon offsets, which essentially, as you ship, you offset one-to-one -one in verified renewable energy, energy efficiency, or forest protection projects, um, which are, again, a one-to-one -one offset of what you're doing. There's some steps you can take right away, kind of on the right-hand side there, um, but thinking about it through your industry-wide partnerships and agreements. Offsets do indicate an additional cost often, um, so how can you kind of set within your different networks that this is something that everyone will do? Um, but it can also help you get ahead of any regulatory requirements, maybe from your stakeholders when thinking about reductions or whatever it might be. It's a step that you can take now um, with every one of your shipments. On the next slide, if you're considering offsets, um, just some considerations to keep in mind. Not every offset provider and every offset project is a great one. Um, so be very conscious when you're choosing what your provider is or who your provider is. Um, there are many that have popped up, um, but the most important part is that offset projects are verified by independent third parties. So this can be ACR, BCS, um, whatever your offset project is, you should have the source of how it's verified and how it's calculated. 
other factors are shown here. Um, this will be recorded and sent out, so feel free to use it as a reference. But some key ones, um, again, can they be verified? Are they additional? So would, are these actual offsets that would not happen without a donation? Um, can they be measured? Are there co-benefits? So when thinking about something like preventing deforestation, typically there are community benefits as well, where you're not just preventing deforestation, which is an economic activity that happens for a reason, but how are you working with the community to ensure that there are long socioeconomic changes that benefit them and prevent this just from happening somewhere else? The last one is permanent. So what's the actual life of a project? Um, be wary a little bit sometimes with reforestation. There are some really great projects, but sometimes planting a tree doesn't always ensure that that tree won't be cut down later. Um, so again, just a lot of different things to consider um, when thinking about offsets to make sure that you do it right. And on the next slide, uh, we have built offsets into some of our programs. Again, we try to make it as easy as possible for you to do this. We work with carbonfund.org foundation. They're a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, so they focus on true great projects and not profitability. Um, they have about 150 projects in their lifetime, I think, in 50 countries. When you think about offsets, some prefer to be near your operations, but oftentimes a global offset indicates kind of the global change. When we do offsets, uh, it's integrated into the system so you can have it automatically apply to offset each individual shipment. If you don't ship it with us, we can always help you offset in addition to that calculation portion. Um, but every time we get our partner started by investing in different offsets, so our Flexport LCL shipments, Ocean Match, where we pair different companies in different containers, um, but disaster relief shipments are carbon neutral for free. Um, going back to that concept of when you're activating for disaster relief, you're often exasperating the cycle of emitting greenhouse gas emissions and contributing to climate change. We want to ensure that our disaster relief shipments don't cause that. So we offset those shipments for now. And on the next slide, uh, just an example of this in action. So we work with Fairphone, their social enterprise in the EU, and their mission is to build a transparent and sustainable smartphone uh, with a very ethical business model. So when they looked for a forwarder and a partner to do this, they wanted to ensure that the impact of their operations didn't outweigh their goals. Um, so we've worked with Fairphone to help them shift emissions away from air freight, but to offset the rest. Um, because they know that there's only so much they can do immediately to reduce those emissions. So by offsetting 100% of the rest of them, they're able to still think about the majority of their mission. Um, we believe very strongly in their mission, so we actually help them pay 50% of their offset fees 2019 through most recently in 2020, which is just an example of how shippers and logistics providers can work together for shared goals. I want to leave much, a lot of time for questions, so I'll leave it at that. Um, my email is on the next slide, Kathleen at flexport.com. If you have questions, if there's any way we can help you with a lot of these free services, please reach out. Um, we want to use our technology for as many people as possible. That's great, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting stuff. Uh, and I think we had a few questions on the, the q and I don't know whether um, Kathleen or Alan, you'd like to respond to, to those questions. And uh, uh, other participants, please uh, add your questions here or raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, it's uh, Alan McKinnon here. A, a, a question posed by Andrew Lamb, um, who's obviously keen on 3D printing, um, and, and wondering if an analysis has been done of the relative carbon costs of manufacturing locally, um, as opposed to manufacturing in more remote locations and then shipping the products on, on mass. Um, I, I can't cite a, a single research project that I know that does that. Um, it it's obviously depends very much on, on the product group. Um, uh, so, I mean, you'd obviously have to have that analysis done for different categories of product. There are a lot of variables you'd have to factor into your calculation clearly. Um, you know, you'd have to look at the carbon intensity of the electricity within the country. Um, you'd also have to look at the choice of transport mode for the international movement. Um, back in 2004, I was uh, one of the contributors to a study funded by the UK government uh, addressing what they call the food miles issue. In other words, 
um, is it better for us to import our food from long distances, like in the UK from New Zealand, uh, as opposed to um, using locally consumed product? Um, so that one has to do then a life cycle analysis of the products, and you know, it's with certain food products, uh, it's easy to show that it's actually better to source the food over longer distances. Um, if, if it's coming from a country with the right climate, um, with good soils and so forth, um, it can have a much lower carbon intensity than a locally sourced product. So simply minimizing the distance the product is transported doesn't necessarily minimize the emissions. Because if you do your life cycle analysis, you often find that the transport related emissions represent a small percentage of the total. I mean, the calculation is dominated by the production and the fertilizer and all these other things. Um, so that relates to food. Um, but but uh, once you move into manufacturing, things may be different. And um, so if, if you're interested, Andrew, I mean, I'll, I'll happily scan and, and see if I can find some academic research on this subject and I can certainly provide you with that information. Thanks, Alan. And there, there was another question, I think, uh, from Eric at MSF about carbon pricing and the, uh, the rate being around 40 euros per tonne or thereabouts. Um, how do you calculate it in the, in the life cycle cost? Uh, I had a similar question, I think, uh, around, you know, what should carbon be worth? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure where that figure comes from. I, 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 people often quote the European emissions trading uh, system price. Uh, it may have gone up to 40 euros. It, it certainly has been rising recently. Last time I checked, it was about 25 to 30 uh, euros a tonne. Um, th that is conditioned by supply and demand. Uh, I mean, it's the it obviously relates to those controlled sectors. I think that's about is it 40 or 45 percent of European industry is is now covered by the emissions trading scheme. Those sectors that use a lot of energy and emit a lot of CO2, um, and and so there there are caps imposed on how much uh, CO2 they are allowed to emit, um, and then depending on the level of activity. Um, then it depends how what the demand is for carbon credits. So it's a price which is determined really by the, the, the nature of the caps imposed by the regulator, in this case the EU, um, and also the, the, the demand from those organisations that are emitting uh, CO2. But, but it, it gets us into, as I said in my presentation, the, the economics of all of this. Um, there has been research done to work out how high the monetary value of carbon should be worldwide to send the right price signals to businesses and organizations around the world to keep us within our 1.5 degree temperature increase. Uh, I think one study suggested that we would need a, a carbon price of I think 120 to 150 dollars per ton uh, and that factored into companies balance sheets uh, to send the right price signals. Um, but referring back to what Kathleen was talking about, the other thing is, is how much you have to pay currently for carbon offsets as well. I, 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 I saw a US study which suggested that um, the, the cost of a carbon offset could be anything from $1 a ton to $40 a ton, <laughs> depending on the nature of the, of the offset. Um, and, and one thing that does concern me is that, that I mean, it is possible to buy carbon offsets relatively cheaply at the moment. I mean, they may not be properly verified and so forth. But some companies may see that as an easy option. And once they do the calculations, they realize it's, it's cheaper getting an offset than it is actually to genuinely decarbonize their operations. So, um, yeah, I'm rambling. But hopefully all of that was of, of some relevance to the question. Thanks, Alan. Um, maybe, maybe a question. Does anybody else have any questions they would like to ask? Please raise your hand. Uh, meanwhile, um, maybe a question I have for Kathleen um, from a logistics point of view. Um, what about with regard to what's called slow steaming in order to save fuel or money? How effective do you think this has been uh, in saving carbon emissions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it depends because it's one of the steps that a 
uh, shipping line can take, but oftentimes, because of course it, it saves them money or using less fuel, so it's a win-win on that case. Um, but in the humanitarian sector, I think that's where some of the challenges might come in, because um, oftentimes speed is what you're looking for, so it depends if you have those trade-offs. Um, and it just depends also what data is available, because oftentimes for um, when you're calculating those emissions, that even if the carrier is choosing slow steaming and having that option um, without ex access to that data and really um, kind of open partnerships to show what they're doing, it can often be hard to even quantify it. Um, so I think like any answer that's there's never going to be a silver bullet to what um, is the solution. Slow steaming is part of it, but it's a matter of how that plays into different organizations' plans and their access to what's going on. Um, I'd be curious, curious to see what Alan thinks about it um, from his studies of kind of the larger industry approach though. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, again, quite a bit of research has been done on the carbon impact of slow steaming. Um, there, there was a, a much quoted paper um, published about 2011, 2012, uh, which reckoned, I think, that for container shipping between 2008 and 2010, I think it was, it, it reduced CO2 emissions by about 11% relative to what they would otherwise have been. Um, and then if one looks at the greenhouse gas, uh, emission studies done by IMO, the, the most recent one in 2014, again, has quite a bit of data suggesting that slow steaming is an, an effective way of, uh, of decarbonizing. Um, I, again, I, the companies have very little choice in doing this. I mean, one thing that surprised me when slow steaming began, it was the whole industry began to slow steam. Um, and, and therefore, um, and, and reducing speed by what, 15% on average, increasing transit times by a corresponding amount. So. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just looking actually at another question which is, which is related to this, uh, which is asking about NOx emissions from shipping, um, because again, uh, when you sow the vessel, you reduce fuel consumption, you reduce emissions of all pollutants, not, not just the greenhouse gases, but NOx and SOx and, and all these other things uh, as, as well. I mean, the focus of this webinar has obviously been in CO2 emissions, um, but uh, you're right, there are lots of other pollutants come from, from shipping. Uh, in addition to in NO2, um, there's SOX emissions as a particulate matter as well. Um, there's interesting research done on the health effects of that of people living in the vicinity of major ports around the world. Um, obviously, the um, IMO has been cleaning up uh, the shipping operation. Um, you know, particularly SOX emissions have been reduced quite dramatically uh, recently uh, as well. So, but there's a more general point here that although I personally and others are, are obsessed with climate change and cutting carbon emissions. We shouldn't overlook the fact that there are lots of other externalities um, from logistics. Um, and in, in much of the developing world, I think people are perhaps more concerned about air quality than they are about CO2 emissions, you know, because that impacts directly on their health, whereas they see climate change as a sort of longer term uh, development. Um, whereas in Western countries um, where we've had tighter emission controls, where air quality is superior, we're maybe less worried now about air quality and more concerned about climate change. So it's the, it's the relative importance attached to these different environmental impacts, which has to be borne in mind and considering how that varies um, from country to country. Thanks, Ellen. I see there's one more question um, about from Ashwatha, I think maybe you answered some of this um, in your presentations, but um, the question here is what, what are the options for carbon reduction other than load planning? Uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, obviously, improving energy efficiency, um, we, we spoke about switching to alternative fuels. I, I mean, so the load planning obviously is one of the, the five categories of measure that I, I spoke about in my presentation. Um, so I, I think it was it was once Al Gore who said that um, in dealing with climate change, we're not looking for a silver bullet, it's silver buckshot. You know, it's, it's a, a whole range of things which uh, we can apply, which should be mutually reinforcing to, to drive down emissions. Um, so, but, but certainly load planning is, uh, is very important. I mean, just, um, I, again, I've been working in this area for a long time. I think many people feel that 
the main way in which we're going to decarbonize logistics is through technology, you know, through redesigning the vehicles, through switching to alternative energy sources. And I think they often look, often overlook the logistics management contribution. You know, they, they overlook the operational and the behavioral aspects. Um, and they're just seduced, if you like, by all the sort of advances in technology. I, I think to get to those really deep reductions in emissions that I spoke about, we need to apply the whole range of things, the, the technological ones, the behavioral ones, things like load planning, the operational ones. Uh, I think, and the good thing is that most of these are, are mutually reinforcing. Uh, maybe just a, a final question then uh, that I have here is around the, uh, I think you mentioned some, some of the ambitious carbon reduction targets for shipping and air transport. How likely are these to be achieved? Yes, that's a great question. Um, it's very hard uh, to, to say. Um, I mean, the ICEO is honest about it. They say their targets are aspirational. Um, in, in the maritime uh, sector, again, some people have claimed that uh, those IMO figures would be very, very hard to achieve. Shortly before the IMO declared those targets, two or three years ago, the International Transport Forum published a report uh, when they looked at the various ways in which the shipping industry could decarbonize its, its operations. Uh, and again, that would be a mix of um, technological and managerial measures. And, and they were actually quite optimistic about this. They reckoned that you, know, you could have a pretty highly decarbonized uh, maritime system by the late uh, 2030s. Uh, the, the big problem for those two sectors is the, the life of the asset. Um, I think in 2017, the average ship was 21 years old. Um, I mean, aircraft, again, have a lifespan of 20, 30 years. Um, and, and so uh, if one's relying on technology here, if we were switching away from, I don't know, kerosene-fueled aircraft to, to batteries, it, it would take a long while for the new aircraft to be adopted. Um, and, and therefore... I don't think anything's going to happen very quickly in, in these areas, but there is potential. I mean, so we could use e, um, synthetic fuels and, and aircraft. Uh, we can move to L, LPG and, and other um, fuels for, for shipping. So there are things that can be done. But, but personally, if you pin me to the wall and said, what's the likelihood that uh, these targets will be achieved by 2050? I, I would say I've got some doubts uh, if we're going to be able to actually do that achievement. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, thanks also to Kathleen uh, for her presentation. Really helpful. Um, if, we, if you have any further questions and um, would like to send me an email, I can pass those on. Uh, if you would like to be put in touch with any of the other um, participants today, also uh, please send me an email. Uh, my call to action uh, to, to those of us working in the humanitarian sector now must be to make an urgent contribution to tackling a whole range of growing logistical challenges, in this case around um, climate change. And knowledge, what we're saying as HLA is that uh, knowledge is key to the future success of humanitarian logistics services. And so your support to the work of, of HLA is very valuable and we'd encourage you to join if you're not already a member. Um, and as I say, also, please uh, go to our website for any other information about, about HLA um, and uh, check out our social media channels. We'll be posting a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel and links in, uh, in other locations. Um, and I'd just also like to thank my colleagues uh, Jamie Anderson and Anna Lake, who have been supporting us in the background, helping with uh, social media and uh, helping to make this uh, webinar today happen. So thanks very much to them. Thanks again to you all for joining and we wish you a very good day. Thank you very much. <laughs>